technology is usually not the problem. Um, it's almost always a people process uh, issue. Uh, and interestingly, from a from a state of DevOps perspective, uh, we started studying culture with the first uh, with the first state of DevOps report in 2014. And we have continued to look at culture and the impact of culture every single year. Hi, this is your host, Sopin Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of Tia for the Stock. And today we have two guests, Eric Maxwell, DevOps Transformation Practice Lead at Dora and Google Cloud, and Stephen Kim, CTO of Carrick. Eric, Stephen, it's great to have you both on the show. Thanks. Nice to be here. Great to be here again, Swap. It's my pleasure to host you folks here. And today the focus is going to be on the state of DevOps report 2023. Let's just kind of jump into the report and talk about what is the goal of this report? We just finished our ninth year of research and uh, the, the goal has been consistently to understand what are the capabilities that drive specific outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, and so the outcomes um, that we're all looking for are you know, organizational performance, team performance. We've looked at you know, what drives software delivery performance, operational per- performance, et cetera. Um, and then we have identified, you know, many capabilities that uh, influence um, the, the the performance in those areas. If you just look at the in, in general, the whole evolution of IT space. Uh, when I say IT space, I'm talking the old, very old data center time and in modern, in the whole cloud native uh, SaaS based space. Uh, the things have evolved. Things have changed. Also, if you look at the whole a CNCF landscape or cloud native landscape, we hear about new technologies. It's hard for me to keep up with that. Think about organizations, they do want uh, to kind of dip their toes in the latest technologies, the latest jargon, the latest buzzword, which can be kind of overwhelming, intimidating for their developer team. So did you also kind of, was there any focus in this report to actually also understand how organizations are trying to maintain a balance between what's coming new and what's stable that they can use for the next 10 years. Interestingly, we just released what we call Dora Core. uh, And the purpose of Dora Core is uh, specifically to take our findings as a a comprehensive look over the years. And what are the things that we've continued to validate year over year and to to formulate the core model. And so the, the purpose of that is okay, you want to get started, you want to know what are things that we have found in the research, what are things that are tried and true and ways that you can apply the research to improvement now. Um, And then, you know, if you want to go above and beyond that, you can take a look at the individual years because, you know, we we study different things, different years. um, And then you can take a look at the individual models that we produce uh, on a year to year basis. And, you know, you can use those to kind of do more experimentation and and kind of, uh, you know, go into different directions. But but the purpose of of core was to present that that uh, view of things that we found, you know, and revalidated many times. Yeah. And those things that, um, you know, that Eric's talking about are really wonderfully useful maps uh, for us to go to navigate when we're trying to navigate through the kind of change that you're talking about swap. Right. Um, and it's not, you know, you talk about technology change, which we can plainly see, uh, but it's also organizational change. Uh, that really is what we're navigating, you know, in, in professional services. Also Carrick is a professional services company. Um, uh, an organization wanting to go to make any, uh, monumental change, you know, move over to GCP, uh, move over to the cloud, move over to containerized, move over to a new way of doing their development processes, um, cannot look at just the technology that's involved. That needs to be there, obviously. Uh, but really, what, what was really neat for me in the Dora report, I mean, I think a lot of things that, that Eric, we're really, really lucky to have him with us, uh, can help us understand better are um, you know, what sets certain teams and organizations to be better positioned to take on change? Um, what are the things that we have to go in and do well in order to help the organization and the teams navigate through that change? Um, and so I would really love it if, if during this time while we have Eric, um, you know, we, we kind of dig into his insights uh, into the organizational team and culture aspects um, that are covered in DORA in the DORA report that you can go to see for yourselves. That'd be really cool for me. 
Now, can you also talk a bit about what are some of the key findings uh, of this report? I want to look at from two perspectives. One are that these reports give us a kind of glimpse of the major trends. At the same time, there may be some gotcha moment where like, hey, we did not even expect that. What are the things that stood out? At a high level, uh, you, you know, we've kind of identified uh, five key takeaways from this year. Uh, one being that you can be as fast, as stable, and as reliable as you want to be. Uh, but none of that really matters unless you have a nice, health, healthy culture. Uh, we also see that user centricity and focusing on the user, so adopting a product mindset and letting you know, the user drive uh, everything that you do is a key indicator of successful teams and successful organizations. Um, we also looked at documentation again, which I know to some people might be uh, kind of a boring topic, but the, the, some of the findings that we have um, in the way that quality documentation amplifies technical abilities. As an example, uh, we see a 12.8x improvement in trunk-based development for organizations that have high levels of documentation quality, which I think is quite amazing. Uh, it kind of turns a maybe a boring topic on its head and, and makes it much less boring you know, to people that are looking to improve. Um, and then, you know, we looked at flexible infrastructure, which was a highlight. And so, like previously, what we did was we kind of looked at the NIST uh, five characteristics of cloud computing. Uh, and we asked, you know, are you taking advantage of these characteristics? And we kind of used that as a proxy for using cloud. Uh, this year, what we wanted to do was we wanted to separate those things and understand you know, what role does cloud play? What role does flexible infrastructure play? And does cloud enable flexible infrastructure? And what we found, uh, you know, as practitioners, we this is probably a, a, a kind of a no-duh kind of mode. A lot of us have been talking about this for a long time, but re what really matters is how you implement cloud. Um, and if you use cloud without flexible infrastructure, you actually see a decrease in performance metrics. But if you use cloud by taking advantage of the, the characteristics of flexible infrastructure, that's kind of where you see improvement. Um, and then we also took a look at uh, individuals that identify as being underrepresented and how does work distribution uh, affect those people. Um, and so, you know, from a, from a highlights perspective, uh, that's, I, I would say those are kind of the, the top five. Eric, when I was listening to you, I felt that, you know, it was more about people there. You know, you're talking about moving fast, user-driven documentation. These are all people-centric problems. And I felt, I have seen that technology is the easy part. People is the difficult and challenging part. Can you talk about when we do look at, you know, uh, this report and when we look at organizations, you know, they are also evolving with the, the evolution of technology. So can you also talk about what kind of different organizational cultures you are seeing there? You know, you bring up a really interesting point about technology and, uh, you know, with the customers that I work with, and I'd be curious to hear Stephen's uh, experience as well, but technology is usually not the problem. Um, it's almost always a people process uh, issue. Uh, and interestingly, from a, from a state of DevOps perspective, uh, we started studying culture with the, first, uh, with the first state of DevOps report in 2014. And we have continued to look at culture and the impact of culture every single year. Um, and, and so, you know, this year is no different. Uh, one of the things that we always look at is uh, a, a Westrom defined generative culture. Uh, and so this talks about cultures that, you know, uh, have high levels of cooperation, high levels of information sharing that uh, have, you know, low levels of hierarchy, more kind of flattened uh, structure where, you know, messengers aren't shot, so to speak, um, you know, embracing uh, change, embracing learning environments, these types of things. And, and we see that uh, organizations that embrace cultures of this type have the highest level of, of success. I am an engineer after all. Uh, technology is difficult. I think it's definitely the part that we, uh, or the cultural part is a part that we definitely underappreciate, right? And it's the part that we have developed less muscle and discipline and, you know, sort of socializing around. And so that is definitely where the focus needs to go. There's a lot of headroom for improvement over there. Um, and also the second thing I'll point out is that, um, and this is also hard for me to accept, 
<laughs> as an engineer, which is sometimes you have to compromise the technology to account for uh, organizational you know, weaknesses, right? So these things as you go to work through to try to optimize uh, uh, toward the organizational uh, health and things like that, sometimes you take a lesser technology solution uh, because it's more adoptable and it's more practical for the organization, right? And so it really is an interplay between the two where right now I think the technology is definitely the part that we probably understand better uh, and a lot of what Eric's going to go ahead and share about organization and teams is things that we can really learn and develop a lot uh, from. Do you also feel that sometimes technology or right tools can bring a lot of cultural changes? I mean, sorry, a lot of practices that evolved from Google itself and do have become kind of cultural norm. So what do you feel about right tools, right technology can actually bring the cultural changes because they empower the teams or they empower, you know, even even decision makers to be able to do those things that were not possible without them. That's a great point. I know we're going off a little track here, but I think um, the interplay between uh, technology and, and organization, if I can kind of uh, simplify it like that for brevity, um, is is really at a crux, uh, an important part of what the door report goes in and helps us understand better as well. But yeah, it goes in the other direction as well. Um, good technology can go and help with organizational change as well. So. You know, I've, I've, I've spoken a lot about good um, technology contracts uh, and good loosely coupled architecture, for example. I mean, loosely coupled architecture is a simple example. Microservices um, that go in and, and support uh, project and team structures from a release cadence, from a loose coupling, from a contractual point of view. Those things can go in uh, and, and provide opportunities for flexibility and visibility and things like that there as well, right? Previously, we were talking about organizational structures. Let's just narrow down and go, go and look at those organizations inside them. What are the teams types are there, once again, uh, through this uh, survey, where you're like, hey, these are different kind of teams that are there within organizations, and they also, once again, uh, influence uh, the adoption of these technologies. Every year, we try to do some additional clustering uh, by taking certain um, certain groupings and, and seeing, you know, are there clusters that emerge in the data? Uh, and, and this year, we identified uh, four distinct uh, clusters. Uh, one being user-centric uh, teams, so teams that are very heavily focused on, you know, user value and, and moving user value uh, into the hands of customers uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, we looked at feature-driven teams, so the opposite. You know, these are normally teams that take business requirements and, and develop features um, instead of uh, user value. Um, and then we also looked at developing teams, so these would be teams that are really, really heavily focused on like kind of getting the first release of their product out. Um, you know, oftentimes they're associated with smaller companies uh, in our data sets. Uh, and then we looked at balanced teams. So teams that do, you know, uh, everything kind of in a, in a more balanced fashion. Uh, and so those were the, the four clusters and perhaps not surprisingly to, to this group, the, the user-centric teams and the balanced teams seem to have the highest levels uh, of performance, the lowest levels of burnout, higher levels of, of team satisfaction, things like this. And so I think, you know, that kind of coupled with the, the user-centric uh, research that we did really tells us a story about designing for the users and, and how important these things are. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, Eric. I actually hadn't realized um, that these team clusterings emerged from the data. Uh, sort of, uh, I thought that they were prescribed, um, you know, classifications that we would go to, that you had bucketed people. That's very, very interesting that that's what came out. Um, just a couple of comments on the team types. Um, we strive in our engagements um, to be what you would call uh, user-centric. Uh, we, we focus on outcomes uh, that matter to the organization. Maybe not at the very top. You know, we're not a McKinsey and Co. We're not going to advise our clients on business outcome, um, business objectives, and things like that. But at the top level, where we talk about product, uh, product velocity and agility, where we talk about quality of service, um, we are outcomes oriented in that sense. And that that definitely makes sense, right? Because um, you know, we're, we're not the kind of organization that goes and says, hey, these 40 things that, you know, you have to go and do, we'll go ahead and, and take that off your shoulders and, and get that done, a kind of a thing. The other thing that I want to go ahead and add is, um, besides that we found success like that, is 
uh, the developing teams. Um, so uh, you had mentioned, Eric, a lot of that might be smaller organizations, but also um, that also probably represents smaller organizations inside larger organizations, right? So a lot of the times the way we affect change even at scale in the large organizations is to start small. So, you know, you've, you've heard them called lighthouse models or pilot models where we go and take an idea, we take a small corner of the organization as proven grounds to production, and then we go in and, and scale that out farther upon success. And, um, you know, maybe we cover it here or, or the audience members can go in and, and read the report later, but it's pretty interesting on the, across the four team types, the different characteristics of what, you know, how they tend to burn out you know, versus how much they find job satisfaction, you know, uh, and how productive they are. Um, it's really, really interesting. And I found it consistent uh, across our engagement as well, which obviously shouldn't be a surprise, um, on user centricity and then across uh, the, the developing teams. And a takeaway for me, uh, maybe that I hadn't thought about enough, was, for example, on the developing teams um, of while it's exciting and it's fun, that there might be, um, you know, whether it be burnout characteristics or whatnot, that we probably need to be a little more cognizant of as we go to make pushes on a, on a small tax surface. I agree. And, you know, one of the things that we kind of hypothesized based on the, the results that we received and, and the clustering around developing teams was that, you know, perhaps the focus was on getting code out and getting these proof of concepts out and the, the focus on things like software delivery, uh, automation, velocity, might be sort of deprioritized uh, and which might lead to the, the higher levels of burnout. So that's kind of one of the things that we recommend for teams that might fit into this cluster is, you know, maybe spend a little bit more time kind of focused on the software delivery and, and operations. Can you also talk about, you know, if you look at some of the lessons or, you know, what advice you have for organizations, if you look at those three, you know, set of organizations or these four teams, of course, in different use cases, it's a different approach. I mean, some are like not <laughs> at all uh, ideal for, you know, some cases, but what would be the ideal approach for organizations to become more productive, you know, move faster, stay secure, and of course, you know, Teams don't get burned out. So my recommendation is is always going to be the same for all of the clusters, and it is just start doing the work and uh, create a mindset of continuous improvement. And you know uh, what we've seen from our research is that you know companies that adopt this mindset of continuous improvement are the most successful. Um, I also wouldn't focus too much on you know the the actual numbers from the metrics that you're collecting. Rather, think of the metrics as a, as a gauge that you can use to understand where you're at and then are the things that you're doing, you know, having a positive impact on what you're trying to achieve and the outcomes that you're looking for. I love that reminder, Eric, uh, of using that as a, a conversation instigator of uh, how should we look at this and all of the wonderful nuances that the Dora research team is putting out is really, really helpful. We're very grateful. Um, it's not only a happy coincidence that the research coincides with what we're seeing out on the ground, uh, out in the field as well, but that last thing that we talked about for me is a pretty good summary um, of uh, along the ways of advice, uh, which is we find a lot of success uh, in user-centric approach, which is uh, user-centric approach, which is uh, talk about um, uh, end outcomes that we really care about, uh, be flexible about how we go um, and, and change our course if necessary to go to meet those outcomes, keep everybody engaged and owning the outcomes has really, really been effective for us and that breeds healthy teams. And then of course, along, along the development route, being cognizant of the things that, um, that the research uh, went and shared and also what, what Eric advises uh, about don't just focus on uh, getting to the goal and velocity only by any means, uh, but also think about um, you know, all the common things apply of, of of sustainability and scalability are things that you need to think about from the beginning as well. So that's a good validation for me today as well. Eric, Stephen, thank you so much for taking time out today to uh, talk about this report and most importantly, those insights and advice. Thanks for all those insights. And I would love to chat with you folks again. Thank you. Thank you.